As uh, everybody was introduced, we're going to be exploring the pros and cons of uh, promotion and promoting your engineer from within, right? So uh, this is something that uh, I think has been has been discussed a lot about different disciplines, just a generic who's getting promoted. Promoting within is, a, is something that companies should do for the most part, pros and cons. Today, uh, let's talk about engineers specifically. So what qualifies me to present this, um, and we've already talked a little bit about my background, but I have managed between teams of 20 and 30 engineers from various disciplines within a matrix organizations and a different, few different companies that I've worked for. Um, this means indirect management, uh, pulling from a pool of resources, uh, whether it's, you know, industrial, mechanical, electrical, um, civil, various different domains and trying to accomplish a project. Um, I've had direct management experience uh, overseeing uh, di dis discipline specific engineers as well as project engineers. Um, so that would be having a mechanical engineering uh, discipline working for me or uh, somebody that is assisting me with projects uh, and trying to accomplish a, a project management um, goal there. I've also managed maintenance teams from across the globe, um, both technicians and engineers um, from the Emirates to Russia, to Thailand, to the US. Uh, and making sure that uh, maintenance operations and programs are implemented and put into place uh, and tackling that type of project. So uh, I have seen a lot of different engineers from around the world. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, despite that, you know, that diverse uh, kind of setting, a lot of engineers have really, really similar personality types, regardless of where they're from. So today I want to talk about who's an engineer, um, the personality types of an engineer, and uh, that'll help shape the discussion for what makes you know, an engineer a good person for a promotion, uh, for a leader, and some of the things that you can expect that might be challenges along the way. So who is an engineer? So an engineer is somebody that has an educational background in engineering, obviously, right? That's a, a, a known fact. Uh, and a lot of times you have to be licensed to be considered an engineer for the sake of discussion today. We're just gonna say that um, anybody with an engineering degree should be assumed to be an engineer. And because that is true because of the personality type that is formed in their educational background. Um, so an engineer is typically taught to solve a problem with a finite solution. So we're talking about academics here going through college, um, going through all of the different classes between Calc 1 and Calc 3, uh, you know, statics dynamics. Typically, you are provided a very complex problem and expected to find a finite solution. Um, which is interesting. This is an important point of, of why sometimes engineers have uh, challenges in a leadership role. So this is an important one that we're gonna loop back into. The second thing that uh, when I consider who an engineer is, uh, I, I did some research and I found a quote that I thought was uh, very interesting in that I, uh, Freeman Dyson says that a good engineer is a person who makes a design that works with a few original ideas as possible. There are no prima donnas in engineering. And this kind of explores that person and that personality type of who is an engineer, right? So personality of an engineer uh, on a Myers-Briggs case study, um, it found that most prevalent personality type to be an ISTJ. So Without getting too involved in the Myers-Briggs system, essentially it breaks down different types of personalities uh, and you can kind of fit yourself or slot yourself into these different personality types to understand uh, you know, who you are, what makes you tick. Um, and they found that this ISTJ is the most common specifically for engineers. So this would be introverted people, observant people thinking, you know, they think before they act, they're judgmental. Um, and I, I, I 
found that and it really resonated with me because I think that when we think of a stereotypical engineer, this really does fit that mold. Uh, somebody that maybe isn't super extroverted, likes to focus on tasks, um, things like that. And so, like I just mentioned, a lot of engineers are going to be task focused, um, detail oriented, uh, technically very strong ability to solve complex problems. Um, and those are typically considered positive attributes, um, typically. So some of the things that engineers also struggle with is diminishing returns. Um, case in point would be uh, when I was working at a non-destructive testing facility, I was managing um, three different labs and we had various engineers that were required to provide um, analysis and reports for their, their tests. And a lot of the times they wanted to get down to as you know, minute of a detail as possible. And it would consume days of their time trying to figure out that last little piece of the puzzle. When in reality, you know, they, they already had discovered that the failure perhaps was from you know, too much torque or too much whatever it was, strain of some sort, and the report could have been wrapped up. Um, but engineers like to have that final conclusion. And part of this goes back to the education that we talked about of we're taught to find the finite answer. Another uh, uh, challenge that engineers have is prioritization. Typically, uh, when an engineer hits industry, they are provided with what their priority should be. So solve this problem, do this task. Uh, and, and those are typical attributes that engineers typically enjoy because they like to solve the problems to completion. So that kind of tells us about who an engineer is. So when we're talking about promoting your engineer from, from within or promoting or hiring or anything with an engineer, um, I think that it's, it's important to look at what we consider as a leader. So what a manager, some of the characteristics of what we would expect on that side of things. So uh, according to um, the Grot One Network, uh, when people stop and think about the quintessential leader, chances are they've, they're picturing an ENTJ. Uh, so this is somebody that is very articulate, um, we, they are willing to hear all kinds of opinions as leaders. They make a decisive decision about something. So um, it's typically like the captain is what they have uh, anointed that personality type as extroverted, intuitive thinking and judging. And you notice that this is not the personality type of an engineer, right? Uh, a couple common characteristics with the thinking and the judging but the introverted versus extroverted is different, right? The intuitive versus uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot it for a second, um, the observant, right? So it's feeling a little bit more out, uh, not necessarily knowing exactly what the answer is, but you can kind of insinuate what the answer would be. So my thought on what a leadership personality is, is also an ENFJ, uh, where you're feeling and you have a little bit more a kind of empathy towards a person. And I think that this is important. Uh, that previous website I had mentioned calls this the mentor. Uh, and I think that especially when you're going from an engineering role to entry level management where you're leading people, um, that mentorship quality is extremely important. As you proceed up the management chain, um, that typically can change maybe towards that more charismatic um, captain mentality uh, that we saw on the previous slide. But I think my personal opinion is that if you're looking at somebody to fill a small team lead role, uh, they need to have some empathy towards the people that they're working for. Um, and what makes a good leader, in my opinion, is in a workplace setting, this is really based on positional requirements. So a leader can be various personality types as long as they are meeting their objectives, they are influencing people in a positive way, um, and, and that sort of thing. And a lot of that is based on what position they're required to do. So... 
the next slide is a segue. So we have talked about the person personality types of different engineers, person personality types of leaders. Um, let's talk about the situations in which people get promoted. So when to hire, when do companies hire uh, cross industry? There's kind of two mentalities. Should we hire based on a forecast or should we hire based on our current requirements? So this is to say, you know, we don't necessarily have work right now where we need to hire people, but we know that we're expecting something to come through. Should we hire them or should we wait until we actually see um, revenue coming in? We actually know contracts are coming in. And this is where the should and realities don't typically align when money is involved because at the end of the day, the companies are looking for, you know, their bottom line impact. If you hire somebody too early, you don't get a contract, you're, you might be you know, in the thick of things. So you might be in a tough situation there. So typically in industry, it's a little bit more reactive than proactive. Situations in which hiring is typically required would be like a termination, a resignation, where uh, a position is, is opened, but it's not a new position or creation of new positions. So strategic corporate direction, or if there's, so that's to say, if they're gonna start a new division, maybe they're looking at um, making a new position for starting an engineering management um, program within a university or something like that. Or uh, they wanna segue from fabrication into, from you know, something into something else, plastics into, into metals, or uh, another uh, example would be the creation of a new position because you just gained a large contract. So um, the importance of this is that when companies are looking at filling these positions, um, they're, they typically are looking at filling this immediately. They wanna find out, okay, look, we have this new position that's been created so-and-so left, or we have a new contract, this job is open, we need to find somebody that can immediately start working. So they're looking at who to target now. And this is an interesting thought that could probably take up a lot more time on, on the webinar, but uh, I, I, for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna touch on it for just a second here. And who is typically hired um, when to fill those positions and oftentimes it's gonna be high performing individuals. And intuitively this makes sense. You have somebody that's very good at their job. Um, you know, Joe Schmo is an engineer that's never been laid on any of the deliverables. They've done an excellent job. They communicate well, they work extra hours. Um, this person is a shoe in for this position, but does this really make sense? Uh, if X, Y, and Z, if Joe Schmo is good at their job, Surely they must be good at other people's jobs too, right? Isn't that what we're kind of saying when we are promoting our high performing individual into a new position because they've not necessarily been trained for this position. Um, this isn't something that they have done before. This is a, a new set of requirements. So this does not always make sense to hire just a high performing individual, but Oftentimes that is what happens. So let's take a situational example here. Uh, company XYZ just landed a $10 million contract and needs to expand. They're looking to promote with them. Uh, they promoted their star engineer who I just discussed to lead the new project. This engineer is now responsible for a group of five engineers and is required to work with various other domains and disciplines, including you know, planning, accounting, marketing, billing, all of the things that make a project successful. So we know now that the oftentimes in industry, uh, a position is made available that needs to be immediately filled. There isn't a lot of time to necessarily train this person for this new position. Uh, and you're expecting this person to, to be that star performer that they were in their new position. And this can create issues. And these are the issues that um, we're, we're gonna focus on today. So the obvious challenges. So I'm going to show you a video, uh, which I think is well quite funny to start out with. Um, but 
is kind of relatable. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Well, oh, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, you hear the stories, it's, I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. So this, this I think is extremely relatable to managerial positions in that uh, you're trying to uh, essentially herd your people to to get the outcome that you need. Um, in this case, they're herding cats, which is a funny analogy. Um, and their goal is to not lose a single cat in the process. Um, a project manager is teaching all or leading all sorts of disciplines, whether it's a team of five, team of 30, team of 100, to make sure that that you're successful at the end that you know, and success is, you know, in this case, based off of budgetary success, scheduling success, also cultural success, making sure that your team stays positive along the way. So the obvious challenges uh, in this case with engineers, and I, we look back to some of the attributes that we had previously touched on of, of who an engineer is. So now you're taking an engineer that was task focused and based on individual tasks that now has to assign tasks and they have to prioritize tasks. So instead of getting into the thick of things, they need to be able to tell their people what they need to do. Uh, in addition, instead of solving these complex problems, they need to allow their team members to do that and to succeed. So these are all kind of opposite of what we had previously discussed of what an engineer is. Um, and to touch on some of the, the things, um, diminishing returns, leaders obviously cannot get fixated uh, and they have to be self-assigning their prioritize, uh, priorities. Um, and this is something that can be very difficult for engineers in that when you are typic, when you're graduating uh, from school, and you're going out to industry and you're solving individual problems that your manager or your project team leader, whoever it is, is assigning to you. Um, you don't really have a priority. You you're doing what you're told and you're solving those problems and it's awesome. Um, going from that to saying, okay, now I have to juggle my clients' expectations. I have to juggle internal expectations. Um, prior, prioritizing things, not just for yourself, but for your subordinates can be an extremely difficult thing for engineers to do. Uh, something else that I wanted to touch on uh, that's a challenge for engineers specifically is conflict management. This is probably never taught in, I can almost certainly imagine it's never taught in academia of how to manage conflict appropriately. Uh, and as engineers, the introverted side of people typically will shy away from conflict. Um, and as a leader, uh, regardless of your position, you will have to manage conflict, whether it's personalities of your team, whether it's prioritization and your client having different expectations than what you are providing to them. Um, there's a challenge for engineers to address that aspect. So what should we do? Should everybody just convert from uh, being an introvert to an extrovert? Is that really where we want to be? Well, no, that's not really what we want to do. Leaders can be really any, any type of personality. Um, and as a leader myself, when I try to teach my engineers, um, I don't teach them to be a specific role. I teach them, try to teach them a specific skill set. So this is to say that uh, I'm not teaching you to just be an engineer. I'm not teaching you just to do a task, but I'm teaching you to understand the bigger picture, why we're doing things. 
So it's not to say, here's your, here's your problem that I need you to solve. It's to say, here's the problem. This is the situation that arose. Um, let's look at what do you think might be a good priority? So that helps teach the prioritization skill. Um, or, you know, conflict management, oftentimes leaders are taught to not allow um, conflict to trickle down to their subordinates. And, and that would be to let them focus on the tasks and let the leaders focus on the stuff, right? So with that said, I think that as leaders, we need to provide opportunities uh, for our subordinates to learn that type of thing, particularly with engineers who need to probably be gently eased into how to manage conflict, how to manage prioritization, things like that. Um, something else that we can do as leaders is to embrace the technical expertise uh, of who we are, but with balance. I think that engineers make uh, exemplary uh, leaders when it comes to technical project managers, engineering managers. This is because we have that knowledge to be able to solve the problem. Um, and with proper uh, training and teaching, we should be able to take that skill set, you know, wind it back a little bit, and allow our subordinates to come up with their best answers. And then we also know typically if they're right or wrong. Uh, you know, if somebody says, you say, solve two plus two, and somebody comes back with, I think that's five you might hear them out and understand why they are saying that. But at the end of the day, because we have that technical background, we should be able to say, well, I think the answer is probably more likely to be four, but I appreciate your opinion. This is how I came to my conclusion. And that helps teach the engineers multiple things um, and, and helps them grow as individuals. Uh, also, with that said, I think that it is important to hire based on skill sets that the project needs, not just past performance. So this is something that I had touched on about your high performers. Not all high performers at their current job are going to excel at their next job. Um, and that's not, that's not to say that everybody that's a high performer will be bad at their next job. That's not true at all, um, but it needs to be balanced uh, we can't just make assumptions that somebody that's a you know, superstar at their current job is going to be prepared for their next job. So something to be cognizant of. As engineers, when we're looking for promotions, we're looking for leadership opportunities. I think that it's important that we acknowledge our stereotypes. So we talk, talked about the Myers-Briggs personalities. We talked about um, who, who maybe some of the typical ways that we think and we act. And leaders don't always align with what that is. So if you want to be a really good leader, sometimes it means that you can't work with your office closed, right? Your office door closed typically means that you are not allowing other people to come in and it closes you off as a person as well. Um, and I think a lot of engineers are more of the closed door type of workers. Um, as a leader, we need to acknowledge that, or as an engineer, we need to acknowledge that if we want to be a leader, we need to open that door a little bit more. We need to allow other people to come in. Um, and so acknowledging what makes us tick and learning from that can help uh, with our next position. Uh, also taking risks. So this isn't to say that uh, we should fudge our risk factors when we're designing bridges so that they might collapse. Um, this is to say that if we are typically a door closed engineer, um, you know, a risk might be to expose yourself in a different way uh, to maybe go out and do something, interact with people in a way that you aren't typically comfortable with. And that that's the type of risk that I'm talking about. And that can reap extreme benefits because um, you don't want to be cast as a stereotypical engineer. Uh, if you're really looking for um, stepping up in the career ladder, you want to be uh, looked at as, as somebody that is approachable, um, that is good at solving problems, but can also lead other people too. So um, take some risks and uh, you know, prove to people that you're, you can do uh, what's required in the next position. And looking at I mean, any potential students that we have, um, I would 
consider taking some classes outside of just the engineering position. I know that we have um, other courses that are required, uh, your general education courses and things like that. Um, and kind of taking a different perspective on what courses you're taking. The engineering courses, like I had originally mentioned, and this segues into the next step right there, is they require you to solve a problem with a finite solution in most cases, um, not all cases. Um, but the, that's not typically how the real world works. Um, and this can help balance you to be able to say, for instance, in the real world, if, if you're an engineer, a lot of the times those problems that you're facing do have a finite solution. But if you're a leader and you're managing people, there can be 10, 20, 30, 50 different ways to come to a, a resolution of what you're trying to, to, the problem you're trying to solve. Um, and those are, that, that mindset is a little bit difficult for engineers to grasp that managing people isn't an equation X plus Y equals Z. There's a lot of different ways to handle that. So, uh, and professors in general, I think, um, can help with that, right? They can help teach students that um, when you get to industry, that a lot of the problems that you face aren't something that is just out of a textbook. Um, with that said, a lot of problems you will face are out of a textbook. But um, to be well-rounded, to, to go and grow into a leadership role, it helps to be able to understand that a lot of the problems you face um, outside of the, the data problems that you're, you're finding solutions for um, can be solved in various different ways and need to be solved in various different ways. So that's, that's really the conclusion of my presentation. Um, to summarize what we just talked about, we went through the different personality types of an engineer. We went through the different personality types of a leader. We saw that they didn't necessarily mesh, um, but we also acknowledged that, that we shouldn't get bogged down by just the Myers-Briggs analysis, that there's opportunity for everybody and every personality type. Um, we talked about uh, when positions are, are needed to be filled and the challenges that the positions uh, that are getting filled hold with lack of training, um, with the expectations, with hiring and traditionally just your high performers. And then we wrapped it all together to say, uh, there's pros and cons of the personality types of engineers. Um, you have difficulties uh, with engineers, with some of the traditional ways that they're being taught, uh, but you also have the opportunity to be excellent leaders as engineers because you have technical expertise. And if we reflect on who we are as engineers and we understand our own benefits to what we bring to the table and detriments um, to, to how some of our personalities typically tick, we can help shape who we want to be to be very successful in the workplace. So that is all I have for you today. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening in. Um, I guess at this point we can take some questions. So hi everyone, uh, we're taking questions from you. Um, if, you got, if you wanna type in on chat, you can type in and send and I'll read out there. And other than that, if someone wants to like uh, ask questions in person, you can do that as well. Okay, um, so by the time everyone's putting that on, uh, let me just see. Okay, so there's one question uh, which says, they're asking any thoughts on striving to be a technical lead versus a manager with direct reports and shifting towards management of people. I, uh, they have the assumption that they would lose the opportunity to further develop technical skills. Yeah, so this is interesting. So a lot of co companies, uh, specifically larger companies, will have two, um, two branches of how to grow your career. They'll have a technical career path and they'll have a, a management career path. And um, I think a lot of people think that these paths are exclusive. 
um, that you can't be a technical expert and be a leader um, of people. And in some cases, that's true. And in every company is divided differently. So part of what, if you're trying to accomplish uh, being a technical leader and manage people, uh, you may have to vet who you work for a little bit, and that can be a difficult thing. But a lot of it is even if you're a technical leader, you have the power to influence other people in a positive way too. So um, as far as striving to be a technical lead versus a manager of direct reports, um, I think that, yeah, sometimes you do lose some of that technical knowledge and that ability to, to do a lot of that stuff. But if you're going into a prod, uh, manager of people role, um, I think that you know that a little bit ahead of time. And a lot of companies will still be interested in um, having you do technical things. For instance, uh, most, well, most mid-sized companies to major companies will provide you with um, reimbursement for a professional society. So if you wanted to be part of IEEE or if you wanted to be part of uh, ASEM or ASME, a lot of companies will allow that path to happen. Or in a worst case, you can still do that on your own to, to help grow your own personal technical expertise while still being a manager. Thank you. Um, so uh, Nate, uh, are you able to like, uh, could you share the case study link or the title on, uh, on the Myers-Briggs analysis by Rover? Is that possible for you to share the link on the chat? Yeah. So. This is a smaller a person, uh, smaller study that was done within, um, I think there was a student, a master student that was looking at different person personality types within their college. Um, but I did some further research along that as well and found that that study seemed to hold true throughout um, different things that I had been reading. So, but yeah, you can have that there. There's also another link um, regarding the Myers-Briggs personality types that I'll share right now too. And that's the one when we talk about uh, being a captain or a mentor or different things like, like that, um, that's that kind of goes through some of the stereotypes of what an ISTJ might be. Um, and also provides what just each letter kind of means. So if you're interested in learning more about Myers-Briggs, um, you can do that through that link or you can Google it and there's a lot of information there too. Okay, thank you. So we have a second question here. Uh, it says, do you type are a hot button item? It isn't just about personality types. Gender and culture slash ethnicity factor in. We just stereotyped engineers as ISTJ. Can women also be engineers? Do they fit the mold? Can they be leaders? Are they strong enough? You, that, those are all uh, interesting questions. Uh, and thank you for that question. I think that um, I think that there's a little bit of history involved in this question as well in the traditional gender roles of what used to be commonplace. I mean, it, it's still hard to break that mold in a lot of situations, but it's acknowledged now. And in my experience, I think that that is uh, gender specifically being an engineer, things like that is a non-factor. Um, and you know, you look at different teams that are put together and uh, there's also research based uh, on this statement too, but typically if you have a more diverse team, you have more diverse ideas uh, and you have, you can find a lot more success than having, you know, the traditional, maybe, you know, 50 years ago, um, you know, only, only guys being engineers coming up with only guy solutions to things. And um, I've worked with teams, like I said, across the world, different cultures, different races, different people, different genders. And uh, yeah, I, I just think that teams and engineers should be as diverse as you really can get them. And there's two reasons. One is you get better ideas, different, more diverse ideas. But also uh, when you're working with a service company and your clients are perhaps based out of uh, Japan or something like that, um, if you have a team full of one one track minded people, you're not going to be able to relate to your clients very well. 
So it's important to have a diverse team if you're looking at um, opportunities uh, around the country, around the, the world, things like that. That's correct. I totally agree with you. I, I didn't even I think uh, gender should not be a factor or, you know, a parameter to just judge that someone can be an engineer or they can be a good leader or not. I think it's just your skills that matters like, when it comes to being an engineer or any other leader as well. So moving on to the third question. So it says, uh, some of the manufacturing firms are managed by private equity firms that tend to push their leaders. How do you address this issue? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? So they're asking some of the manufacturing firms are managed by private equity firms that tend to push their leaders. How do you address this issue? So private equity, uh, yeah. So this is, I guess, compared to a private entity that would be owning a company. Um, and I don't know that private equity versus, um, you know, somebody, a specific one, two owner based system makes is something that you can really categorize specifically. Uh, I've worked for owners that are extremely, extremely difficult, right? Everything is margin based bottom line and that's all they care about. And I think that's what this question is alluding to is uh, when you're trying to lead and all that matters to somebody is how much you're making, it does become a bit of a toxic culture if it's not managed very well. Um, and this is something specifically to engineers, this goes back to the conflict management side of things. Uh, and engineers typically have, have some difficulty managing personality types that are aggressive um, that you might see from a private equity based uh, ownership group. Um, with that said, I think that there's, as you move up through the ranks, if you're involved specifically with management that is pushing you extremely hard, um, I think that you have to be able to balance it, balance between prioritizing what's important between getting the project done the right way. Engineers also have a code of, of morals that we need to uh, adhere to. So there's only a certain amount of shortcuts that we can take um, and industry's full of shortcuts. So uh, it's going back to um, trying to do what's right versus what's on the bottom line. And some of that is just managing the personalities that you have. Um, managing isn't just managing down, it's managing up as well. And making sure that your leaders that are ahead of you uh, on top of your food chain are um, that you're meeting their expectations. So sometimes uh, you may be telling your subordinates, this is how we should work. This is what we should be doing. Meanwhile, um, you're telling your management something maybe a little bit different to, to manage their expectations of a project as well. Thank you. So let's move on to the next question. Um, how do you deal with cases where the internal staff didn't get the job slash promotion, but you get someone from external? Yes, so the promoting from within this is actually very interesting. So recently with uh, RK is a company that I'm working with right now, they had hired a new president and um, the director of operations here really wanted that job, right? So it, it can be a little bit demoralizing, right? You want a position, you think that you're a good fit for that position. Um, something that I think the industry needs a little bit more of is transparency. And uh, I think that as this kind of goes back to my personality type of being a little bit more on the feeling side of things is I think that people given an opportunity to empathize um, can, can do that. So not always with your leadership, sometimes they're very hardened and, and it's not the best approach, but if you're transparent about your expectations um, and that maybe perhaps not getting that promotion uh, didn't meet your expectations. Uh, then you also have a little bit of an advantage to be able to control that situation. Um, tangenting onto that a little bit is uh, most people, not just engineers, uh, 
prefer to avoid conflict. Um, and so a lot of people, I've, I've seen people fork out thousands, tens of thousands of dollars just to avoid conflict. Um, they don't want somebody to be mad at them. They don't want um, to have a situation that they're uncomfortable with. Um, and when you're looking at this approach, I think something that's very valuable is if you, if you know that and you can hold that upper hand to say, I am going to create conflict and I am going to go to my managers and tell them that I am not happy, tell them this is my expectation. It you control that scenario and you control that dialogue. So I'd say try to manage that conflict and be in charge, be in control of the situation. Um, and, and that's going to really help you out. Thank you for that. Um, so Mr. David Warwick says, oh, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, Myers-Briggs is a tool that shows our preferred slash most natural personality, but people can learn how to develop abilities to act like another personality. For example, an introvert can learn to be more outgoing and extroverted, although she or he may not prefer it all the time. So he's asking the question, what activities would you recommend for the ISTJs to develop their skills to become a leader or mentor? Yeah, so this is great because that's absolutely true in that the Myers-Briggs kind of teaches, tells you a little bit about who you might, your natural characteristics. Um, you don't have to be who you are. And sometimes being a leader means acting a little bit, right? And doing something that you're a little bit uncomfortable with, uh, maybe, a, you know, maybe you're an intrinsic uh, introverted person um, to begin with, but you know, as a leader, you have the expectation that you reach out to your people and to be successful, you may have to, to, to branch out a little bit more. Uh, and those are all taught characteristics, right? I think that some people are born leaders and some people can be taught uh, a lot of the characteristics of being a leader. That's why there's books. That's why people buy the books about how to be good leaders is because they're trying to self-develop those skills. So one, one way to develop those skills would be reading some of the content that's available through books, through online, through different courses like that to be a leader. I personally don't like that as your primary focus on trying to develop your skills. I think that practicing those skills uh, is gonna be much more fruitful. So you can take your uh, academic based knowledge that you've gained through reading various books and then applying that and trying it out. And sometimes you have to be willing to step on maybe some toes here or there, right? And, and maybe you go up to somebody and you're a little bit more assertive than you typically are and you realize that that wasn't the outcome that you were anticipating, um, or maybe it was. And so I think that going out and taking risks, as I had alluded to, uh, keeping your door open and sort of, instead of closed, um, going out and asking people, how are, they, how are they doing, do they need help? Um, and really opening up, I think, is going to be your first step. Thank you so much for that. So with that being said, um, uh, there's an, uh, another last question that's from my side. <laughs> I'm an uh, engineering management student aspiring to be an engineering manager soon after graduating. So uh, my question to you is like, I am a student and um, what do you think? As a student, should I be more concentrating on my technical skills rather than my, uh, let's say like the soft skills or something like that? Or, or, uh, or do you think, uh, because uh, till now, I have heard a lot of people and I've met a lot of seniors who say that, you know, your skills take you anywhere, but uh, I have not seen them emphasizing more on the leadership skills as much. Per uh, uh, to say, like, few people do, but uh, not a lot of people do that around me. Uh, so do you think how much should a student be uh, giving the importance to a technical or the slash manager skills? Yeah, so my personal opinion on this is that um, engineers in general uh, or technical experts make really, really good leaders um, because they have that technical background. So um, yes, focusing on some of the technical side of things is important to be able to, uh, I'll, I'll give an example. We have um, 
you know, we had a new project manager that we hired and, um, and, and she was actually from India, uh, but uh, she didn't have a really strong technical background. Uh, and it proved to be a little bit difficult because when you're talking about how we're gonna produce a specific um, product, uh, not knowing the difference, and this is not a true statement, but between steel and aluminum or carbon steel versus stainless steel or some things like that proved to be a challenge. With that said, she had the opportunity to learn a lot of those technical skills. And when you're hiring into a new firm, you're not expected to know everything. So uh, there's opportunity to, if you have an engineering degree, um, you are assumed to be able to solve problems, but you're not assumed to be able to solve every problem. And you are going to be taught a lot of the technical stuff that you need to know to do your job. Um, as far as the softer skills, I think that that's probably going to progress your career in management a lot further if you start learning those softer skills early on. So um, it depends on what your approach really wants to be. If you want to be a technical leader and just stay on the kind of a technical leadership path, I think maybe focus on the technical side of things. But if you really want to move up the corporate ladder, um, I would suggest trying to develop those softer skills from a very early uh, onset because, because you'll probably be, people's opinions of you will start shaping the second that you arrive to your, to your position. Um, and if it takes you three, four years to develop some of those soft skills, that's probably going to set you back. People are already going to maybe pigeonhole you potentially into to who they thought you were. Um, and it may, you may be required to shift positions or shift companies to be, get what you want. But if you arrive day one with a strong sense of leadership and they say, okay, wow, you can, I see this person progressing immediately, it will set your career path in a different direction. Okay, thank you so much for 